just tell me your name so the editor knows. Okay, I'm Lisa Enos. I uh, produced Ivan's Ecstasy, and I was also uh, the female lead, Charlotte, or one of them. Tell me the progression. Did you get the script from Bernard? How did this uh, come together? Well, I have a, probably a different starting point than he does, but I've been gathering information. My mom died of cancer in 97, October of 97, and I met Bernard in, I think, September of 98. So just, you know, just under a year later, and I had all these things that I really wanted to say about death and dying in the modern world and about, you know, what I'd just gone through with my mother, who was only 56, so she was still in the workforce, and... Um, when she came down with cancer and, and, well, she came down with cancer a little bit younger and she died at the age of 57. So, um, you know, still relatively young in the, for, for, um, in the grand scheme of things. I have a grandmother who's 97. So it was kind of shocking and it really kind of, she had all, all her life had all these friends who were very close and very dear and, people that she was on the phone with every day. But when she got sick, it not that they didn't want to talk to her, it's just that it's like, it was, it, she was alienated. She was alienated by her friends because, you know, once somebody is diagnosed with a fatal disease, then that person is thinking about it all the time. But the moment that they start to open up and talk about it to somebody, um, not everybody is capable of dealing with those subjects. You know, so she tried going to therapists, and, she did, and I didn't want to hear about it. My brothers didn't want to hear about it. Nobody wanted to hear about this woman's pain because it's just not a pleasant subject. Didn't fit in with what I, it didn't fit in with my Holocaust documentary I was making at the time. You know, I was in, in Belgium on Mother's Day, you know, right the year she died, and couldn't um, couldn't even find it in my busy schedule to call her. And uh, when I finally did get around to it a day or two later, I found out she'd been in the hospital. So um, I guess I, there was like a little bit of a cathartic thing for me to make a movie about someone who dies of cancer, and to set it in in Hollywood really wasn't wasn't my idea at all. It's interesting how the, the scene where the two young models sort of, as soon as he starts talking, they just get up and leave. Yeah, and yeah. It's not for them. It's not their time to think about it. It's not, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, uh-oh, he's talking about something that we just don't want to hear about right now. We've just done five lines of cocaine, and he's talking about dying, and you know what? My mom died of cancer from taking them, she was taking those pills, this is just too weird, let's get out of here. And that definitely is, but it doesn't matter, you don't have to be a young, shallow, pretty model to, to have that attitude. Um, you could be somebody's dear friend for, for 40 years and still not want to talk about your friend's disease. This reminds you of your own mortality, or it, it saddens you, or for whatever reason, it's not a happy subject. So did he tell you that he was doing a film about mortality? No, he wasn't doing the film when I met him. He was, in, he was writing two big budget uh, productions for Universal Studios. We should probably name him because we're not going to... Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. So when I met Bernard, he was working for Universal Studios. He was writing a script called The Phantom of the Opera. He was rewriting The Phantom of the Opera and setting it in modern day New York, whatever. And he was also involved in a project called Thief of Always, which uh, they ended up turning into a... CGI movie and then pulling the plug on it. So he was basically involved in um, what we call development hell at Universal. And he'd been trying to make this movie for the past three years, The Thief of Always. It was another adaptation of a Clive Barker novel, which he did with Candyman, but it wasn't going to be as scary. It was going to be kind of aimed at a younger audience. And he kind of poured his soul into this movie. and. And they basically just fired him off it and decided to make it into a CGI movie as soon as he turned it in the script that they liked. So, I mean, here, here, so here Bernard was. He's working on um, Phantom of the Opera, which he didn't really have any interest in, but it was kind of like his consolation. Okay, well, you know what? We're doing, we're doing CGI now with that other movie you wrote. So why don't you, um, 
beef up this script for us, you know, the, take this old Phantom of the Opera and let's reset it in modern day New York. Okay, great, right. And um, he, Bernard was, was basically going to the meetings once a week at Universal, kind of going through the flow on these scripts and um, with no production date in sight. And it had been, it had been since 1996 been four years since he shot a movie and um, we were we basically he was interested in what I was doing in the documentary world I was finishing up a documentary when I when I met him and he was asking me all sorts of questions about the budget and what I shot on and, and how it looked and I ended up showing him my Holocaust documentary which I shot in five different countries in Europe and shot on uh, DVC Pro which is about 850 lines of resolution so it's a, actually a pretty good camera for 1997 when I shot it. It was like one of the best things out there and, um, and he asked to see something that I'd done and so I showed him this and he's like, but I thought you said your budget was only $200,000. I said, well it was. So, but this is really good quality. And I said, but that's just how much money it takes to make a documentary. And he kind of went, hmm, and filed that information away. And um, I went about making my documentary, and he went about doing his Universal Studios projects. And, um, and then we actually started dating. <laughs> And, and I ended up moving in with him, and we were still working separately, separate lives and everything. And uh, he, he, he went to a, a test at the Sony HD Center. Um, he went to like some kind of demo they were having where they were, were putting together um, different what they, were, they were, what they were doing is they were, they were showing, you know, digital, just plain old DV transfer to 35, and this is what that looks like, and this is what high definition, this new thing looks like transferred to 35, and this is, this is Digi Beta transferred to 35. So they were just doing a demo of all the different new digital mediums and whatever, old analog video mediums transferred to 35, just for, the, for, his, for your information. This is what all this stuff is, and I think Celebration had just come out and so um, this was on this actually all took place in the Sony lot in Culver City they had the, the HD Center there so they were kind of recruiting people to come look at the stuff and he and he went to a demonstration I think in like March of 1999 and he came back home to me and was like Lisa you can really help me there's this story I want to do it's about this agent you know my old agent um, He's a really charismatic guy, and I and I, you know, I, I threw up my arms, and I'm like, you know, what? I'm not interested in a movie about agents, okay? I'm just not, and I was kind of snotty about it. I mean, from my little documentary New York documentary background, I'm like, ah, couldn't care less. And so, um, and plus, I was working on something else. And a couple months later, my project was over, and he was still in development hell at Universal. None, of, nothing got greenlit. He was still going to these meetings, and oh, maybe this character shouldn't drink tea that's too too English or you know like you know your stupid little nitpicky things that they were that development executives kind of focus on in scripts and he pit, and he started to pitch the story to me again and because I would gotten recently fed up with my one of my projects that I was working on cause it was just not going anywhere as well and he he pitched me the whole story that the whole Ivan Beckman he, this person dies and then you go back in, in time and, and you find out that he died of, um, you know, some kind of disease. And so that's when we started working on, on it. And it's like, well, if we made it cancer, I mean, that, that afflicts middle-aged males. And, and if you get cancer, lung cancer, a, a, lot, a lot of the time, there's two different types, but one, one specific kind is fatal. You'll die within six months. I mean, almost always. And so he needed a, a disease and he needed kind of a case study. And that's where my involvement in the script came in. So he had already had the idea of taking the Tolstoy novella and setting it in this agency setting. 
And I went, okay, okay, all right, I get it. It's a classic novel in Hollywood. All right, well, maybe I might be interested in that, in, in that perspective. But we have to be able to incorporate these ideas about cancer and how people in the modern day die alone. And, and that's basically it. I mean... So the, the indictment of the agency system was not... That was of secondary interest for you? I had no interest in it. None. You're, you're New York... I'm actually from Chicago, but I was, I'd gotten most of my work out of New York, or distributors in Chicago who distribute educational, like, kind of programming. Did you have any exposure, had you had any exposure to that hedonistic, uh, excessive scene that is mm. Yeah, I mean, just on a, I just moved to Hollywood, and I was single, and, you know, I, relatively young, well, you know. <laughs> I was like 27, and and I, I didn't I didn't get into the whole scene per se, but I spent enough time at those parties to know what was really going on. Can't say some of, some of my best friends are you know really heavily involved in in that scene. So I mean I'm not really trying to I wasn't trying to say it was there was anything wrong with it or bad or I wasn't trying to indict the scene. I was just saying this is kind of how it goes down. You know, and, and I'm more interested in display or portraying reality in, in, um, than I am like fiction or escape.